Hey everybody, welcome back to the ECG channel. My name is Reed, and today we're going to be detailing the pathophysiology and ECG features of a subtype of AVRT, that is antidromic AV reentry tachycardia. I first want to say before we jump into this that you can download the PDF of this document down from the description below so that you can follow along and make your own notes. And I also just want to give credit over here. This ECG I pulled from ECG Guru. Dot com. It's a fantastic website. Um, they've got a ton of great collections of ECGs, and uh, I have interacted with some of the cardiologists that are on uh, that page, and they're fantastic and have some great, great stuff. So go check them out. So let's jump into this rhythm. And so when we talk about antidromic AV reentry tachycardia, we're going to see that this is a subtype of a supraventricular tachycardia, right? And so as you look at this ECG here, you see we've got a very regular occurring QRS complex. It is incredibly fast. As we scan through, it's incredibly fast. The rate here is um, somewhere, if I find a QRS that lands on a solid line, maybe this one, you can see it's 300, 150. It's, it's very fast approaching 300, I would say maybe 250 or so beats per minute. So this is very fast, regular, and if you notice, it's a wide complex rhythm, right? My QRS duration, my QRS is wide, right? It is greater than 120 milliseconds, right? So those are just a couple of quick features of antidromic AV reentry tachycardia. This is a very rare, it's for one, it's very rare, it is, less than like 5% of AVRT, right? If you remember from a couple days ago, we did orthodromic AVRT. Let's talk about what happens in antidromic AVRT. So these patients, we have this cardiac skeleton. It's a membrane of connective tissue that is in between the atria and the ventricles, right? This is our cardiac skeleton. And so what happens with the cardiac skeleton is that is what is allowing for when the SA node fires off and sends that wave of depolarization through the atria, it blocks that signal from getting into the ventricles and it only allows for it to go to the ventricles via the AV node. So that the AV node can slow that signal down and then send it through to the ventricles via the normal fashion. But some people have what is called an accessory pathway. And accessory pathways what they are is some type of defect in the cardiac skeleton. And so I'll draw the defect right here. Defects can be anywhere between the atria and the ventricles. So my defect allows for communication between signals in the atria and the ventricles. And unlike the AV node, it does not delay it. So this is my accessory pathway, right? These patients are known to be Wolf, Parkinson, White, syndrome patients, that should be a P, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome patients, or if you don't understand what that looks like on ECG, a couple days ago I posted a video on that, definitely check that out. So what can happen is these people can have antidromic uh, conduction, which means antidromic means in the opposite direction of the AV node. So it can actually have conduction that goes, I'll draw it in blue, up the AV node. And so these folks can have a vicious cycle where they have uh, essentially what will initially occur is that there will be some type of anterograde conduction through the accessory pathway, and then ventricular depolarization will ensue. Okay, and a wave of depolarization will occur throughout the entirety of the myocardium. Notice it's not taking that Hisperkinji system that allows for rapid depolarization, and that is why my QRS complex is wide, greater than 120 milliseconds because it's not taking the normal highway system, it's taking cell-to-cell -cell gap junctions. Well, we kind of hinted at what can happen when that occurs. Well, some people have the ability, not all, but some people have the ability to conduct signal anterograde, anti, anterograde, or excuse me, retrograde, they have the ability to conduct retrograde through the AV node. So they're going backwards up the AV node 
and that causes retrograde depolarization of the atria. And then what can happen again is that signal that develops from that retrograde depolarization of the atria can actually conduct back down the accessory pathway another wide complex QRS. Then we have that retrograde again, retrograde P wave. And then the cycle will be viciously repeating itself, right? And so that's a reentry pathway between the atria and the ventricles, hence AV reentry. And it's antidermic because it's going backwards through the AV node. So that's what antidermic represents. And so you're gonna have a regular, fast, wide complex tachycardia that we see here. Now, this can be very difficult. It can be very difficult to discern ventricular tachycardia versus antidromic AV reentry tachycardia. So it's not always gonna be the easiest thing to determine um, kind of out the gate. So one thing that's gonna help you determine antidromic AVRT is one, do they have a past medical history of Wolf Parkinson White pre-excitation syndrome, right? Clinically, that's gonna give you that. We know that people with ventricular tachycardia, they usually have evidence of AV dissociation. If you don't know what that means, I've got a video on monomorphic ventricular tachycardia coming up in two days. But essentially what that means is that the atria and the ventricles are dissociated, they don't beat together. So you'll have P waves that do not correlate to QRS complexes. But both of these are gonna be very wide complex tachycardias. And so here we see that we've got this wide complex rhythm. It's very regular. And what you can actually do is you can actually kind of this an advanced concept, but based on the axis of my QRS, right, upright in my lateral leads, leads one and AVL, V5 and V6, it tells us that ventricular depolarization is going towards the lateral aspect. It's also negative in my inferior leads, so it tells me it's going away from my negative leads. So you can start to figure out where the accessory pathway might be but as I scan through, I look for AV dissociation, but I look for P waves that are occurring on these ST segments. I'm looking for P waves that are occurring on the ST segments for AV dissociation. I don't see any. I see no AV dissociation. And so, you know, sometimes, uh, like I said, these are really, really hard to discern. Sometimes you have to treat them like they are VT and then later to find out that they are antidermic AV for entry tachycardia. Um, and so really a lot of this is based on history. A lot of these people are going to be so hemodynamically unstable because this rate is so fast that you have to electrically cardiovert them. And so if you cardiovert this person and they go back into a sinus rhythm, what are you looking for? You're looking for some of those delta waves. But at the end of the day, really what I wanted you to get out of this video was the pathophysiology of antidermic AVRT with the accessory pathway. It's going to really help you understand the treatment of these uh, reentry tachycardias. These people respond really well to procanamide, which is a class 1 antiarrhythmic. It's a sodium channel blocker. And what sodium channel blockade does is it actually slows down the conduction in this reentry pathway. And so that can actually convert them. You don't want to use AV needle blocking agents really in these people. So, um, yeah, I hope this helps you really just understand the, the pathophysiology of uh, antidermic AVRT. If you have any questions about it, put it in the comments. Um, like I said, Really, what you're looking to do in these rhythms is rule out VT, because um, if you can rule it out, then you can kind of rule antidromic AV reentry tachycardia in. So stay tuned. In two days, we'll be coming out with a monomorphic VTAC review and to talk about some of the features and how you can really nail it on the diagnosis of that rhythm. But until then, if you have any questions about this, please put them down into the comments below. Um, 
Obviously, this person's got an accessory pathway, so what's the definitive treatment for them? We're going to ablate it, right? Radiofrequency ablation. We need to take them to the electrophysiology lab and zap that thing with a little radiofrequency ablation. So I hope that helps you all. Like I said, go to ecgguru.com. Just check out, they've got a bunch of free content. It's fantastic. They really just want you to be good at ECGs. And that's a European-based group of people, I think, really in Germany. So, um, yeah, we'll see you on the next video. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, uh, have a great rest of your day.